Great ladies. God, we thank you for your amazing word. Again, your word of truth and life. Encouragement, direction, correction, hope, joy, peace, comfort, strength. <coughs> we pray at this time, Lord God, that uh, what I say, the message that I'm going to attempt to deliver would be from your heart to ours and would be a, an accurate an accurate rendition, reflection of your word of truth, which is our foundation for life and hope and, and happiness. Please, God, speak to us all. We need to hear you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we make this prayer. Amen. There's a British author whose name is John Mortimer, and John Mortimer has written a book entitled Clinging to the Wreckage. And he got the inspiration for this book and a title for this book by speaking to an old gray-bearded sailor. And he asked the sailor, he asked him, he said, he said, sir, is sailing the English Channel as treacherous and dangerous as everybody says it is? And this sailor, the old sailor, responded, oh, no, 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 no. It's not dangerous at all. As long as you cannot swim when your boat is sinking. Well, Mortimer was quite confused about that. And he said to, he said to the sailor, what in the world do you mean? And the sailor said, well, you see, when you're in trouble, if you can swim, you try to strike out for the shore. And inevitably, you end up drowning. As I can't swim, what I do is I cling to the wreckage until they send someone to save me. That's my tip. If you ever find yourself in trouble, cling to the wreckage. Sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, the truth of the matter is, is that some of us, if not many of us, come to worship Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and we're clinging, clinging to the wreckage of life, of our lives. And what I mean by that is sometimes in life, we hold on to the broken pieces with all we have, with all we've got. You see, there are people we know and love who are either out of work or struggling to hold on to their job, and they wonder, you know, what if things don't work out, how in the world am I going to make ends meet? There are people here today who are struggling with a family relationship. And sometimes we get to the point where we think to ourselves, do I fight? Do I continue to fight for this? Do I continue to try to hang on? Or do I just let go? Is it time to just let go of it all? Some people may be dealing with rebellious children or grandchildren. Some may be tired and may be lonely. Even though you're with other people or even though you may be married. And then there's cancer. Did you know that uh, cancer affects two out of every three people in the United States of America? Two out of three. And there's the people here this morning who are battling cancer. It's the people in our family of faith who aren't able to be here because they are battling cancer. And that has to be one of the most frightening experiences of a person's life. All of us have experienced the pain of loss, the loss of a parent or parents, the loss of a husband or a wife, and maybe, probably, but worst of all, the loss of a child. At times, the grief can be so overwhelming that we don't know how we're going to go on. 
See, the truth is that some of us come to worship on Sunday morning, clinging to the wreckage of life in one way or another, holding on to the broken pieces of all we have. So the question is, what do we do about it? How do we handle the heartaches and the tragedies and the disappointments and the loss and the pain? Where do we turn? How do we survive? Well, this morning I'm going to offer you four biblical spiritual principles that will help because everything from the Bible is true and right and helps. But four spiritual principles that will help as we deal with the wreckage of life. And the first principle is this. We're all in the same boat. All of us are in the same boat. Every single one of us. Everyone here and everyone not able to be here. We're all in the same boat. You see, a relationship with God does not make us immune from suffering. A relationship with God does not make us immune from suffering. Now, I know for most of us, if not all of us, that sounds like common sense. And yeah, it is. But the truth is that some people think that when they become a Christian, some kind of invisible force field surrounds them where they are now immune from pain and suffering, but that's simply not the case. You see, nobody is immune, no one is exempt. In fact, some of the finest Christians that you and I know, you know and I know, some of the finest, most faithful Christians you and I know, suffer the most. And some of them are still suffering terribly right now. I know a pastor whose eight-year-old son was dying of leukemia. And he said that he was so angry at God that he took his fist and he pounded them on the dining room table as hard as he could, splitting the dining room table right in half. And he looked up into the heavens and he said, God, why? 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 After all the effort that I had given, put into to serving you and trying to bless you. Why, God? Why? After, after all the effort that I put into to, to your church. Why, God? Why? Why my son? Why me? Why? And in that moment, in that moment, God spoke to him. And God reminded him that no one, no one, no one is immune from suffering. In act, in actuality, the scriptures tell us in the New Testament that all Christians will suffer. Not might, but will. See, no one person is immune from suffering. No church is immune from suffering. No family is immune from suffering. No nation is immune from suffering. There are no force fields in life. And one of the reasons why the Bible is so relevant to each and every one of us is that virtually every man and every woman of God in Scripture suffered. Every one of them. Every single one of them. Every single one. Think of it. Just a few. Sarah suffered for all those years. She could have no children. And back in the day, when you couldn't have a child, especially a man, a boy, a male, Boy, I gotta tell you what, you were treated like dirt. Joseph suffered when he was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Moses suffered when, after all he did for God, was not allowed to enter the promised land. King David suffered when his own son named Absalom tried his very best to kill him. The Apostle Peter suffered as he dealt with the guilt of denying the Lord three times. And of course, our Savior and Lord suffered tremendously as he was beaten, humiliated, and ultimately crucified. And think of his mother, right there at the cross. Think about how much she was suffering as she watched her oldest son, the Messiah, the Son of God, being ruthlessly Murdered, crucified on that cross, hanging there, bleeding from head to toe, gasping for breath. Think about how she suffered. No one is immune from suffering. No one, not even the most faithful Christians. That's spiritual principle number one. Spiritual principle number two is this, and it's amazing. When we suffer, we are closer to God than we have ever been before in our lives. Now, the world's going to tell you the opposite. The world's going to tell you that all suffering is terrible. Avoid it. Let me tell you, 
But God tells us, and it's so true, that when we suffer, we are closer to God than we've ever been in our lives. When I was a little boy, I suffered from the physical and emotional. The emotional effects were horrific uh, of grandma epilepsy. Um, you can imagine, everywhere I went, the leadership had to know I was an epileptic. I go to the YMCA, the lifeguard had to know. Keep your eye close on that boy. Every class I went to growing up in, in, in elementary school and middle school, every teacher had to know. Be careful, be careful. You don't think the kids know? You don't think the kids know? And you know, all kids are nice to everybody, right? <laughs> all kids treat each other so nicely and are so accepting. you got to be kidding me. The ridicule, the laughs, the jokes, the names. Anyway, as I was suffering with that, and I'd be just a little guy, because I was born with it, just a little guy, I remember I, I was crying really hard one day. And uh, my mom... I was close to my mom and anybody. And uh, she came into my bedroom and she said, Audie, she said, you can cry if you want to. That's perfectly fine. We all need to cry sometimes. But the best thing you can do right now is pray. Pray. But don't just close your eyes when you pray and, and see darkness like a lot of people do. When you close your eyes, imagine that you are putting your hands in the hands of Jesus. Just put your hands in the hands of Jesus. And when you do, and when you do, look at his scars. That really hit me. You see, Jesus' hands are terribly scarred. They're brutally scarred. They're scarred with the wounds of betrayal. They are scarred with the wounds of loneliness. They are scarred, they are scarred with the wounds of being rejected and abandoned. They are scarred with the wounds, wounds of suffering and pain. And they are scarred with the blood-stained blood -stained wounds of the nails that pinned him to the cross. When we put our hands in the hands of Jesus, he knows how we feel. The truth of the matter is, sisters and brothers, when we go through suffering, no one else knows exactly how we feel. They may be able to identify with it, but they don't know exactly how we feel. Yet yeah, Jesus Christ does. Jesus does. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about the fact that after Jesus' resurrection, he kept the scars in his hands? He kept them. He didn't heal over them. We know that he kept those scars because after his resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, uh, when the door was locked and they were hiding and all that, you know, the Jews, the, his disciples were... Uh, he showed Thomas the second appearance there. He showed Thomas his hands. He said, look at my hands. Put your fingers in the holes. We know that Jesus kept the scars. You ever wondered why? Why did he keep those scars instead of healing them over as he healed the scars of so many others? I think Christ kept those scars so that we would have an eternal reminder of his suffering on our behalf so that we would never forget that God himself does indeed understand our feelings and our needs when we suffer. Yes, he does. We do not have a God who created the world and then left it alone to operate by itself. We have a personal God, a one-on-one -on -one 
loving God, a God who wants more than anything to have an intimate relationship with us, and, and an intimate God who meets our needs at the deepest levels of life. And that is why our prayers can be so meaningful, especially when we put our hands in the hands of Jesus. Yes, it is true. When we suffer, if we put our hands in the hands of Jesus, we are closer to God than we have ever been before in our life because we are actually holding the hands of God himself. Principle number three is this. Suffering produces endurance and endurance character. By the way, therefore, suffering produces character. Romans chapter 5, Paul says that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Now the Greek word for endurance is hupomone. And hupomone means standing in there by the grace and power of God. Standing in there. Just hanging in there. Hanging tough. Remaining steadfast no matter what. Hupomone is standing in there remaining tough in the midst of the fire of life and allowing that fire to refine us and burn off all the impurities. That's what Paul means when he says that, quote, endurance produces character. See, the Greek word for character is dokaim, dokaim. And dokaim is the word for a metal that has been refined by fire and all of the impurities have been burned away. So what Paul is saying here is that through suffering, we are refined and we are purified in our faith. Through suffering, we grow closer to God. Through suffering, through suffering, and God's refinement of us through suffering, we actually become more like God, more in the image of Jesus Christ. You see, if we never suffered, you know what we would think? If we never suffered, we would think that we don't need God. We would think that we don't need God because, well, we can do it all on our own. Right? No worries. But because we do suffer, we realize how completely dependent we are on God. And isn't that a great thing? We realize how much we need Him. We realize how much we need Him. And though we all need Him, oh, we desperately need Him. The fourth principle of suffering is that, excuse me, the fourth, fourth principle that I'd like to share with you today is that suffering is not the last word on today. It is, suffering is not the last word on today. No, 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 no. And I can think of no more powerful example of this truth than the story of a little four-year-old girl who grew up, who grew up in the Philippines during World War II. The Japanese had just invaded the capital city of Manila. And this little girl and her family evacuated to the northern province of Luzon. Listen to her experience as she tells it. Quote, During the time my family and I were in the province of Luzon, my brother who had stayed in Manila was accused by the Japanese of withholding information about a beautiful horse that was stolen from Japanese officers. My brother didn't name the person responsible, for fear that the whole town would be killed, as the Japanese would do if they found out that the horse was used to communicate with other Philippine towns. My brother and his family suffered the consequences. The Japanese murdered my brother, but before they murdered him, they murdered his wife and two children before his very eyes. My sisters and I were living like frightened rabbits, hiding up in the attic of our house. The roof was made of corrugated steel. There was only three and a half feet of space between the roof and the ceiling. And when the sun beat down on the corrugated steel, it was like baking in the oven. The Japanese had taken all of our food. Even the food my father tried to hide by burying it underneath the house. The whole town, the whole town was literally starving to death. Every night, 
The fathers of the families would gather in secret to pray and to try to figure out where to get food. They learned that there was a huge tree down the street that was edible. So it was cut down, and the pulp of that tree was shared by everyone who was starving. It sustained all of us for a while. When everything from the tree that was edible was eaten, I remember my father doing something drastic. He would hide in the bushes at night, and when a train would pass by, he would jump on it and take some of the canned goods that had been confiscated by the Japanese. Most of the time, my father got canned beets, so we ate beets until I don't know when. But even in the midst of all this suffering, our faith in Jesus Christ was never in doubt. Even when we were starving, even when we were baking in the attic, we prayed and we sang Christian songs and we read the Bible. We just knew that the Lord was with us and would give us the strength to endure. And then you know what she said? She said, my faith in Christ is stronger today for having suffered so much back then. End quote. That four-year-old girl grew up. She grew up to be one of my greatest inspirations in life. She was a member of the First Presbyterian Church in Mary when I was pastor there for so many years. She was very faithful as a member, very active, and she even sang in the choir. She was the best of friends with our own Eve Tansell. Her name is Lydia Woods. Brothers and sisters, the truth is this. Some, if not many of us, come here on Sunday mornings clinging to the wreckage of our lives, holding on to the broken pieces of all we have. And sometimes we have more questions than we have answers. And all we can do is trust. Trust. Trust in the one who gives us hope. Trust in God's word. God's holy word of truth. His word of truth that tells us over and over again that suffering is not the last word on today. Failure is not the last word on today. Disappointment is not the last word on today. Loneliness is not the last word on today. Dementia is not the last word on today. Alzheimer's is not the last word on today. Cancer is not the last word on today. Divorce is not the last word on today. And death. Even death is not the last word on today. The last word on today is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. For through Jesus Christ, God has and will bring good out of evil. He will bring triumph out of tragedy. And he will bring hope out of despair. So let us give him praise. Let us praise him. Let us praise Him. Let us praise God for His love. Let us praise Him for His mercy. And let us praise Him for His amazing grace. Let us praise Him for His goodness. Let us praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him today. And praise Him throughout our lives. Even in the midst of our suffering, and maybe, and maybe, especially in the midst of our suffering. And the children of God said, Amen. If you're able, please stand and sing with me our closing hymn, Just a Little Talk with Jesus, and you'll find it on your insert, and you'll see it in your